Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. Um, the title in the bulletin, I, I gave it probably a little bit wrong to Amy when I, I gave it. I, I don't like putting in there tackling the Trinity. It seems a little bit blasphemous or something, but tackling truths about the Trinity is what I, I think I should have entitled that. And so I would like for you to turn to Galatians chapter 4. We're going to look at Galatians 4, uh, 4 through 6. But I'll read the intro there, just in, chapter, in the fourth chapter, uh, verse 1. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of this world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then heir through God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word today, and we pray, Lord, that we might come to better understand uh, this awesome truth about who you are, uh, one God in three persons, the Holy Trinity. We thank you, Lord, that in this passage and other passages, we see very clearly that you are three persons with one essence, and we ask, Lord God, that you would explain and help us to understand and explain this truth today more than just understand it, that we might apply it in our lives, that we might joyfully worship you for what you've done for us. We pray now in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So today I want to try to, uh, to focus our attention, draw our attention to one of the greatest of all Christian mysteries, the Trinity. Now, I don't want the Trinity just to be a doctrinal theory in our minds, but I want it to be really a living part of our Christian experience. Uh, life in Christ unites us with the Father's love and the Holy Spirit's gifts and power. So we see uh, Christ saves us, Christ has redeemed us, uh, the Father has drawn us, the Holy Spirit fills us. Uh, and all too often this teaching is uh, it's, it's not really discussed much in the church today. And especially in the evangelical church, we tend to be very silent on this today. And some of our greatest theologians... <laughs> Uh, have been relatively negligent in outlining the Bible's teaching on the great truth of the Trinity. Charles Hodge, one of the greatest of the reform uh, uh, of the great reform theologians, uh, wrote 250 pages about the person of God before he even came to the idea of the Trinity. Uh, Louis Burkhoff, another, nearly exhausts every topic about the nature of God before discussing the Trinity. Even J.I. Packer, you know, who is still alive, the great dean of theology. Uh, he's in his 90s today, and his, his bestseller, Knowing God, contains only seven pages on the topic of the Trinity. The whole book is devoted to knowing God, and the person of God, and, and the attributes of God. One of the great errors of Christians today is to think that Father, Son, and Spirit are merely three different ways that the same God reveals himself. Okay? And that's that's uh, something we see in, in false teachers today. And this is kind of like saying, I like the actor Clint Eastwood, okay? And his roles as Harry Callahan and Josie Wales and Philo Beto, or whomever else he played over, you know, 100 years of acting, right? Yeah. Uh, although he's the same person, he plays different characters. Now, that's okay to say about Clint Eastwood or Denzel Washington or Cano Reeves or whoever you like as an actor or actress. It's heresy when we say that about God. The modern era is really no new era, because really there's no new era under the sun. Amen. Uh, it's old-fashioned what we call modalism, theologians call modalism. But the Trinity is uniquely Christian in doctrine. It is a unique Christian doctrine. No other religion has this doctrine. Right. So as we look today at Galatians chapter 4, we're going to try to tackle some of these significant truths that are surrounding the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. Now, Paul, and I just pulled this passage out because Paul does refer in this, you see all three persons of the Trinity mentioned in Galatians chapter 4, but uh, the apostle was attempting to tackle these truths as well because he was combating heresy in the early church. 
Uh, there were Gnostics, and I'll get into those people a little bit later and tell you a little bit about it. Now, the word Trinity, you will never see in Scripture. I like Dr. Weirs was teaching on this a few weeks ago, not this particular topic, but he was saying, so if something doesn't exactly appear in the Bible, does it mean that we cannot discuss it, or that it's not important, or that it's not a theological point? Well, no, that's not the case. But the word Trinity is never used, but we see three persons, one essence, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, clearly designated in Scripture, and we have called that, we've designated that, the Trinity, the triune, the Trinity. So we're going to look at this today. We're going to explore here in Galatians chapter 4 in an attempt to better understand and better uh, understand some of these truths about the Trinity. So first of all, let's examine this passage a little bit more deeply here in, first, or in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. I want us to examine what the Trinity has accomplished, first of all, on your behalf and on my behalf. Praise God. Uh, uh, the Holy Trinity has done nothing less then secured your eternal salvation. Amen. Amen? Amen. And for that, we can be eternally grateful. We can eternally praise God. Paul here in the book of Galatians, he's giving a series of arguments against salvation by works. He's giving a series of arguments against <laughs> salvation by a, a secret knowledge. That's what the Gnostics were, were all about, was they had a secret inside knowledge of the things of God. And uh, if you didn't have that knowledge, then you were lost. And other people were saying that you had to do certain works in order to, to be saved. But we see in this passage, what Paul is saying is you have been adopted as sons of God with all the rights and all the privileges that come with sonship. And he's saying, if that is the case, why do you think that there is something missing? That's what the Gnostics were telling them. You're missing out on something. That's what the works-related righteousness people were saying. You're missing out on something. And Paul is coming back very clearly and saying, if in the past you saw the shadow and now you've experienced the reality, why in the world would you want to go back to the shadow? Why would you want the shadow when you have the substance? And so what he's saying here in chapter 4 of Galatians, the Galatians had heard the true gospel of salvation by faith. They truly put their faith in Christ. They had been true believers, apparently. Verse 3 of chapter 3, you have begun. You have begun by the Spirit. They were true believers. And then we read here, you didn't know God, verse 9, but now you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God. He's affirming the reality of their salvation, but he's saying you are on dangerous grounds. Because you're wanting to go back again to the works. You're wanting to go back again to the secret knowledge. Paul's the only one, by the way, who uses the word adoption in the New Testament. And he uses it in the book of Romans and in the book of Ephesians, and he uses it here in the book of Galatians. And the word uh, for adoption was a compound word, and it, it meant to place someone under someone as a son. And, and that's what adoption is. Adoption from the theological standpoint, as Paul uses it, is that God puts you and me who are alienated, who are outside of his family, he puts you and me under him as adopted sons and daughters. God. You have been put into a family from which you had no background with. You had no right to be in. You were not normally, legitimately born into that but in his great mercy, he has extended salvation to you and to me, and he has adopted us in. Praise God. Now, you'll hear people talk about adoption, but a lot of times they don't go into the specifically New Testament era idea of adoption. Now, the Jews had adoption. That was, it was possible. It was possible oftentimes uh, in the case if they didn't have an heir, they, they might adopt in a situation like that. But it was very, very rare for Jews to adopt, adoption was more commonly a Roman concept. And what Paul is saying here is distinctly, a distinctly Roman concept that he is saying here. Adoption in the Roman world, when Paul was writing, was almost exclusively something that was done with males only. Almost exclusively males only. That's why he uses the word here, sons, your, your sons. 
Males were adopted, get this, not at, you know, nine months of age or two years of age or something when they were still really cute and everything. Most males were adopted at 20 years of age or older. Why? Because they wanted to see the character. Adoption was an economic necessity in the Roman world, or at least a desire, economic desire in the Roman world. The infant mortality rate was so high, you didn't adopt a child, you didn't adopt somebody young because they probably died. That the likelihood was such that they would die. So instead, they had adopted someone that was old enough, that had proven character, that was physically strong, that was intellectually, uh, you know, someone that they would want. For what reason? Because most of the time, those fathers had seen their sons grow up to be schlunks, right? Or they had gotten killed in wars or whatever, and in order to keep the, the, the economics of the household together, they would adopt somebody into the family who was already a proven character. And so they were brought into the family at that time period. And just listen, young people, dads at that time held a lot of power. Patri patsada was, was the uh, potesta, was the, was the term that was used, and it meant dad held all the power. Now maybe you're in a family like that today, I don't know. But your father could execute you for any reason and the law would not be brought to bear on him for doing that. That's power, right? That's when dad says jump, you say how high, right? That was the power in the Roman world that fathers held. And so what they saw a son as a teenager that was sowing too many wild oats, right? That was wild, that was unconcerned, that was, uh, if they didn't want to execute him, they would just say, fine, I'm adopting somebody else who's going to be the head of this family. Now, what was the result of the adoption for the believer? Well, in the Roman world, in which Paul, it was a physical adoption, there were at least four results. You had a new father. You were heir of an estate. That was the primary reason for adoption. Uh, third, all previous debts and responsibilities of adopted sons were wiped out, so if you had college debt, you might put yourself under adoption, right? <laughs> Fourth, the adopted was purchased with a high price. And guess what? That was the motivation for the poor family to give up their son. Maybe economic times have been hard on that family, and they, they, they wanted to raise their standing in the Roman world, and so they'd make a deal with a wealthy family. They'd be paid a heavy price, a high price for their son, and that would lift them out of that economic condition that they had sunk into. Now all that's fine and dandy for the historical reality of what was going on, but think about the spiritual application that Paul's making then too. All of us with faith in Christ have a new father. Amen? Amen. We are now all heirs in Christ to the riches of all of Christ's glory. Amen? Praise God. My mind goes to uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Uh, Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Praise God. Your debt, my debt, has been canceled. Amen. Have any of you ever got? Have you, any of you gotten to that point in your lives where you've paid off the mortgage? The debt is canceled, right? The monthly drear is gone. You know, you get to get beyond that. It's canceled. It's done away with. And the freedom that you have in in, in doing that, well, the freedom that you have in Christ is manifold more than what you have when you're done with your mortgage. Amen. Your debt that you owed against God's righteousness that the, the, the was on has been taken upon the cross of Christ. Praise God. So look at verses four through six here. Look at the, the exclusively Trinitarian theology of this. Look closely at this passage and see all three persons of the Trinity are at work on your and my behalf. Maybe that tells us how great a sinners we really were. Right? That all three members of the Trinity had to be at work for our salvation. Right. Look at this. It's a beautiful doctrine. It's a glorious doctrine. It's an incomparable mystery. The Holy Trinity, we see here, uh, each member of the Trinity are, are participating in the believer's salvation. Look, verse 4. God the Father sends His Son. Verse 5. The Son redeems us and adopts us. Verse 6. God has sent the Holy Spirit into the believer. God the Father has sent God the Holy Spirit into the believer. 
the undeniable involvement of the Trinity for our salvation, it's just, it's almost too much to think about. Right. I mean, it's, look at the passage, in the fullness of time. In other words, when time had become fully pregnant, right? The fullness of time. Mm -hmm. uh, when the fullness of time had come at just the right time, at the ordained time, at the time of perfection, hundreds and thousands of years, all of this had been, uh, had been prophesied, had been predicted, but at the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Why under the law? To redeem you and me from the law. Amen. And look at what does it say? Because of this, he has redeemed us through Christ. He has adopted us. Because we are sons, God the Father has sent God the Spirit of His Son, notice the connection even there, into our hearts, we who are alienated, we who are lost, we were who at enmity with God, and now we can cry out, Abba, Father. You know what that is in Aramaic? That's, that's Daddy. It's Daddy. No Jew would have ever said that about God. And Jesus is telling us, when he says that, and now Paul here is telling us, you have a different relationship. Mm -hmm. No Muslim will ever say of God, my father. No Muslim will ever say, my daddy. Yeah. Daddy is a distinguishing relationship. You oftentimes hear a daughter talking about her daddy, right? Because there is that deep, sweet relationship that is there. It's a relationship of love and of affection and of trust. It's a relationship of the heart. Right. And Paul says that's what you have now through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, through God the Father. You have that relationship. And that's how we can cry out. Well, the second point that we see is I want us to consider only God can make himself known how we are to relate to him. I'm going to take a breaker just one second. Guys at the back, turn off the fans. People are freezing, right? Amen? Okay. Thank you. I just saw that. I can see people are chattering. So it's great. It's keeping them awake, you know. It's fine. But, uh, but I'm afraid that there's going to be hypothermia before too long. So second of all, consider only God can make himself known. And God has made himself known as a triunity, a trinity. So... God is the only one that could have made himself known to us. God initiated the action so we could know him. Don't sit there thinking, oh, I could have known God. I could have known God. No, you wouldn't. You would be a blasphemer, a heretic, or a pagan. Those are your options, right? Or a mixture of all three. God had to show himself to us because God was, what? Unique. And this is really the problem, and I'll try to make a couple of feeble illustrations about the Trinity, but you know, at the end of the day, he can't because he is unique. He's unique. There's nothing else in all of the universe like the Trinity. So when I use a shamrock illustration, or I use this or the other illustration, it doesn't really hold water because God is unique. And that's the majesty of God, is that no matter how much and how long we know him, he will continue to always hold our attention. Right? Right. right. Amen. So God initiated the action. Apart from God revealing himself to us, we couldn't have known through Jesus Christ. We have access in one spirit to the Father. We are born into this world as orphans, as we said earlier in this passage, in relationship to God, as far as we could have been away from him. But by grace alone, our Father decided not to leave all of us helpless. Christ atoned for our sin at Calvary. This Holy Spirit works in our hearts, bringing us to salvation in Him. That's why, let me just say this, that's why it's so important that we worship God biblically. Amen. If God has revealed Himself in the Bible to us, because we could not have known Him apart from God's revealing Himself to us in the Bible, right. how dare any of us worship God in a way that is contrary to what the Bible says. Right. I remember, we think some of this stuff has just happened, you know, in the last couple of years. I remember when I was pastoring back in South Carolina, this is almost 30 years ago now, we had an elderly neighbor who went to a, uh, the First Methodist Church in Lexington, South Carolina. She was a godly, godly woman. 
she came over one day with the church bulletin and she said, Chris, would you take a look at this? She said, what are they doing to my church? You know, she was pushing 85, Mrs. Wurstler, 85 or so, she spent her entire life in the Methodist church. She loved the people, she loved the church, she loved the fellowship, and she said, I can't stand this anymore. And she handed me her bulletin, and her bulletin, it was a special service of worship that included elements of Buddhism, it included elements of, uh, uh, of Native American uh, uh, Indian worship, it included like calling God him and her and you know all this sort of stuff and I just looked at her and I said you know you ever think it's time to leave yeah. it's time to leave. I grew up Methodist too you know yeah. I'm not saying that they're all bad I'm not saying that one bit but I'm saying when that's the case because you're trying to placate so many people mm -hmm. I will stick with what the scripture says and forget about what everybody else thinks Amen. Amen. Right. let's stay with what scripture says You'll be a lot safer for all of eternity because God is self-revealing. He has revealed himself and he's revealed himself to us through his word. And that is the only way that we can know him. Nobody can fully. I, I, I stand up here today with a tough assignment because I don't think anybody can fully explain the Trinity. I've read a lot of scholars and what the, the theories and that they have pro, pro, propounded. Uh, I've read the, you know, the hypotheses that some of them have about it. it the, the entire concept of a trinity is illogical. It's beyond logic to us. Right. It's not something that we can make up. Nobody would attempt to make this up by human logic. <laughs> Only God can make this up, if you believe. Right. True. God had to make himself known to us because we couldn't have known. Now think about this. Uh, Carol and I had five kids, and as parents, guess what? We got to name the kids. That's the prerogative of parents. If I'm going to pay for you know the next 20 years of your life, I get to call you what I want to call you, right? <laughs> so, you know, so we gave them the different names. Naming a child is the norm for the parent because he or she is seen as the sovereign in that relationship. In the Old Testament. Adam, under the creation mandate, exercises dominion over the animal world by doing what? He names the animals, right? He names the animals. He goes, he is the one that gives. The, the squirrel doesn't come up and say, by the way, I think your name is Adam, right? Adam says, squirrel, you're a squirrel, okay? <laughs> That's the way it works out, because there is a system of authority within this. Never ever in the Bible does a human give a name to God. God gives his name to us. We understand that he is self-revealing. He reveals and his name oftentimes is tied, often is tied, always is, I think, to his character or character traits. And when we go along today in our little self-important worlds in 2020 America and we say, well, I think I'm going to call God she, or I think I'm going to call God it, or I think I'm going to call God Big Bam in the Sky, or whatever else. Hmm. Yeah. God says, don't call me that. I've given you plenty of names in the Bible that you can call me, that you can refer to me. Mm -hmm. Refer to me by those. Refer to me in this way because he has <clears throat> named himself. He has revealed that and it's absolutely repugnant and it's theological nonsense for us to come up today with these gender inclusive and all these other types of terminologies to be able to in some way or another try to placate our society so that we look better in their, in their eyes. Right. They could care less about how you look. They simply want you to wash out and water down the truth. Amen. Thus, in order to know God, God is sovereign in his relationships to man, and God makes himself known to us because we could never have known him. Do you remember one of God's best friends, humanly speaking, Moses, right? Mm -hmm. Moses got to go up on the mountain, got to see the burning bush, got to get the law, all those things. Moses said, God, can I see your face? God says, no, you'll die if you do that, right? Nice. I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock. You can see me pass by, but if you see my full glory, you will die. Yeah. Right. And what is always in the nature of man is to try to denigrate the image and the nature of God. Mm -hmm. 
try to demean that, try to belittle that instead of rejoicing in the absolute glory that is the person of the Trinity. Yeah. And so pagans come up with trees and rocks and other things like this. And today we have our own pagan worship in our society today, right? And we do that. Why do we do that? Because we are exchanging the glory of the self-revealed God of the universe for our little idols in an attempt for us to name and manipulate God into being what we want him to be. Right. God had to make himself known. Because guess what? Our sin separated us from God. The Bible tells us we were dead in our trespasses and sins. I don't know of too many dead people that are able to convince themselves of something other than that reality, right? We were, the Bible tells us, blinded by the God of this age. Our wills were held captive to our sin. People say, well, I can use my reason. Your reason is fallen. Your logic is fallen. When this comes, God has to reveal himself to us, and he has done it through his word. Right. God has broken down the barrier of death and separation, the darkness that we were encapsulated in. He has rescued you and me. God has revealed himself in our salvation, and he has revealed himself in our salvation as a trinity here we see. Why was Paul writing to the Galatians? Again, heresy, denial of sound doctrine, all this that was going on. Nothing new, by the way, the same doctrines that we see are we see around us today. It was called the Arian heresy back then, and uh, it's not white guys with skinheads, it's not that type of Arian. It was a it was A-R-I-N, okay? A, a different type of Arianism. And uh, and we see that today, whether it be in Jehovah's Witnesses or, or in other groups like that. It was heresy. Listen, I haven't given you a definition yet of the Trinity. I wanted to hold it back for a little bit. But one, arguably one of the best, most succinct theological statements on the Trinity says this. How many persons are there in the Godhead? The answer is this. There are three persons in the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And these three are God the same in substance, equal in power and in glory. You say, Chris, that's simple. Yeah, you try to write it. Right? Yeah. You try to come up with that. One of the greatest doctrinal statements in the Old Testament, let me take you back to that just to prove this point or underscore this point a little bit better. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 is the Shema, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is what? One. One. <coughs> now, do you know how that really reads out? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our plural God is one God. The word that's used there is plural God. Icha is the word that's used there. And you know what? When God said concerning a a Adam and Eve, the two shall be what? One. One flesh. Guess what word was used there? Same word. Two become one. Icha. Uh, God, hear, o, uh, hear o, o, o Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Icha, God. Plural, but one. I don't understand it. You know, don't look at me like that. But I believe it. The God who has made himself known for our salvation has revealed himself as a triunity, a, tr a trinity. The three persons are of the same attributes in their will, in their purpose. What one wills, the other wills. That's how Jesus could say, I always do what? My Father's will. I'm always about my Father's business, right? That's why the Holy Spirit comes to do what? To glorify Christ in everything that he does. There is an absolute harmony that is held together there in the Trinity. Amen. You say, I can't grasp this concept of three different things and one still be one the same. I don't know if I can illustrate it, okay? Seriously. I read one illustration, it was like if there was a treaty between uh, France and England and Germany, and it was done at the United Nations, and the treaty would have to be, the exact same document would be signed off on if it was in English, if it was in French, and if it was in German, and the terms and the conditions on that would all read the exact same, 
but they would be three separate documents written in three separate languages, but they are essentially all the same doc document. Mm -hmm. Yeah, better than I can do. <laughs> yeah. I don't see you coming up with one better, <laughs> so, so I think it's pretty decent, all right? At each stage of redemption history, God has made himself known. Stop. He's the one that makes himself known. El Shaddai, in, uh, in the Abrahamic Covenant, Genesis chapter 17, God Almighty, right? Uh, uh, yeah, in, in the Mosaic Covenant, he reveals himself. In, in Jesus Christ, he, he fulfills all of that. Well, third and finally, I need to wrap this up, but I want us to... Okay, I did the exposition of the passage, I did the theological content of the passage, now I want you to think about what our response should be to this. It's worship. Amen. It's worship. Our response to the doctrine of the Trinity is to just be amazed with God and worship Him all the more. That's right. Amen. Rejoice in the God of your salvation. My response to the mystery of the Trinity is to just enjoy God all the more because there's just all the more that I can contemplate that I can think about. You know, in a few moments, we're going to close in singing uh, a hymn. And I don't know if we've ever sung this hymn before, okay? And I'm not there yet. Don't worry. I've got about five, ten more minutes, but, but <laughs> don't worry. But I had to search far and wide in our hymnal to find a hymn that was truly Trinitarian. Okay? What do I mean by that? 95% of all of our hymns could be sung by Muslims or Jews, uh, you know, because they're just pointing to God. God. Now, there are some that are exclusively about Christ, and that would obviously be different. Um, some are bi Trinitarian? Bitarian? Uh, maybe. I don't know. Maybe I just created a new word. I don't know. <laughs> some you'll see, God the Father, God. We saw that in that song, Home, today, right? We saw two. <laughs> and like, it is very rare that our worship is actually Trinitarian in what we sing. Now, how many of you grew up in a, in a church where you'd sing the Gloria Patri? Uh, the, do you even know what I'm saying? No. <laughs> Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Spirit as it was in the beginning, now and forevermore, world without end. Amen, amen. Okay? It, it was all three persons were spoken of in that. You know, I, I was sitting just thinking, and I am in no way casting scorn on these hymns. I'm not saying we cannot sing these hymns ever again. Because we'd be singing like three hymns for the rest of our lives, right? Maybe some of you musicians, Joseph Cass, the others of you, write a hymn, right? You can do it. Write a Trinitarian hymn. We'll sing it. Wouldn't that be awesome? Maureen, you can do it. Write a Trinitarian hymn. No, well, so I just gave you a little bit of an assignment there, sorry. Uh, uh, no pressure whatsoever. Be theologically accurate or we'll burn it. Okay. Uh, uh, no, but, but seriously, when we think about all the, the, the songs and some of my favorite hymns I went down through, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven, non-Trinitarian. Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, non-Trinitarian. You know, uh... I'm going to sound like a heretic here myself. Great is thy faithfulness, non-Trinitarian. You know? Uh, holy, holy, holy. Praises God in three persons, right? Blessed Trinity. Okay. Amen. I'm not saying that we always have to be that, but I think it's important for us to realize, you know, to focus and to try. It's okay to write new hymns, right? They don't all have to be written in 1870. Okay? <laughs> It allows us to understand more about the person of God. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, a great English poet, in a conversation he was having with Robert Browning, he remarked, I've read all your poetry, but nine-tenths of it I don't understand. Robert Browning answered back to him and said, Sir, a person of your, cal uh, your caliber should be satisfied if he can come up with one-tenth of what I write. <laughs> it was a slam. Okay? It, was, it, was, it was meant to be a slam. I doubt we'll come up with one-tenth of an understanding of who God is and what God is all about, but thank God we can spend our entire lives trying. Okay, I'm going to tread in, I'm going to tread in dangerous waters here because I'm getting out of my element and I'm getting into music and musicians will probably throw stones at me here in just a moment. I am told, I am told, okay, 
I'm not saying that I say this is true. I, I'm told that this is true. That in music there are seven tones on the major scale. I'm pretty sure that's true, eh? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> but that there are only three structural tones. These are the principal chords, the tonic, the subdominant, and the dominant. Yeah? Yes? Okay. Great. I was hoping that I was still on, on the right chord here. <laughs> These are the three major tones, and out of them comes all of our music. You cannot have harmony without the three. There is a harmony in heaven, friends. The word of God speaks of it back before man was created, when the morning stars sang together, when all of the sons of God shouted for joy. Heavenly music was based on the fellowship of the Trinity. It's an astounding thought to consider. At the most basic level, each and every Christian experiences in an unarticulated form communion with the Holy Spirit. Communion with God the Father and communion with God the Son. The Holy Spirit creates a desire to pray and to worship God. He brings us to faith and sustains us in that faith. Our access to the Father is exclusively through Jesus the Son. Right? Mm -hmm. John 14, 6, no one comes to the Father right. except through the Son. Amen. He alone has offered one perfect sacrifice for all of time by which we have access to the holy presence of the Father. Amen. He is, in fact, your and my great high priest. Right. who is constantly interceding on our behalf. <laughs> he walked through this fallen world, was tempted in every way we are, yet without sin, and so he can sympathize with you and me in our weaknesses. Right. He is a son by nature, and he has adopted you and me in his family. And by grace alone, you are saved. Thank God. Two weeks ago, Dr. Weirs was teaching on Augustine in uh, the Wednesday night uh, Bible study on St. Augustine, if you want to call him that, or St. Augustine, if you're from Florida. And uh, St. Augustine was this great thinker, and he was at his wits end to understand and explain the Trinity. And he went out for a walk, and he kept turning this over in his mind. One God, three persons, one God, three persons, three persons. Not three gods, but one God. What does it mean? How can I explain it? How can my mind take it all in? And he was kind of torturing himself, beating his brains out, trying to understand. And he saw a little boy on the beach. And he approached him and said to him, you know, son, what, what are you doing? And, and the little boy had dug a small hole in the sand, and he had a bucket. And he was going back to the ocean, he'd fill up the bucket, and he'd put it in the hole, and go back and get the water, put it in the hole, St. Augustine, you know, said to him, what, what are you doing? And the child replied, I'm going to put all the water in the ocean into this hole. This little, <laughs> yeah, ambitious little boy, right? I'm going to put it all in the hole. And Augustine, it dawned on him right then. But it is, but is it possible for all of the water of this great ocean to be contained in such a little hole? And then it dawned on him, if the water of the ocean cannot be contained in this little hole, then how can our infinite, how can our limited minds understand the infinite God? Right? right. But our response is to worship him and to praise him. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word today. We pray, Lord, that we might have gained just a glimmer, a glimpse more of who you are in all of your majesty in all of your power, in all of your glory. That, Lord, that you have <coughs> revealed yourself to us. We could not have known what you are like had you not given us your word. And so, Lord, we rejoice that you are the God of our salvation, perfect in three persons of one essence. We don't understand it fully, but we trust it, we believe it, and we glorify it. For we pray now in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.